William Strata Smith, born in 1769 and died in 1839, was an English geologist who was credited with creating the first detailed nationwide geological map of any country. This exact map here, in fact, of England, Wales, and a little bit of Scotland. And at age 18, William found work as a surveyor, and a few years later was working for the Somerset Canal Company. This was during the Industrial Revolution, and as he inspected numerous coal mines in the area, he observed and recorded the various layers of rock and coal exposed by the mining and the creation of these canals. And as he observed the rock layers, or strata, these horizontal layers of rock that we can see in these examples from around the world, again here, here, and here. As Smith observed these at the mines and canals, he realised that they were arranged in a predictable pattern and that the various strata could always be found in the same relative positions. In addition to that, each particular stratum could be identified by the fossils that it contained. And Smith also noted that the exact same succession of fossil groups, from older rocks to younger rocks, could be found in many parts of England. The exact same succession, every time. And he also noted that the older fossils, nearer to the lowest strata, had more basic biological features, and fossils nearer the top strata were more advanced. And Smith called this the principle of faunal, or fossil, succession. And sometime later, the different strata would be grouped in different periods of the Earth's geological history. Smith never saw any dinosaur bones though, like we see here. The first dinosaur bone was discovered by another Englishman, Robert Plot, in 1677, and that was detailed in his book, The Natural History of Oxfordshire. Plot had no concept of dinosaurs though, and after ruling out large known animals like the elephant, he decided that it must have been a bone from a giant human being. And we had to wait until 1824, when bones discovered in 1815 were described by yet another Englishman, William Buckland, were realised as being something else entirely, deriving from a large carnivorous reptile to which he gave the name Megalosaurus. Buckland still didn't recognise the bones as being dinosaur though, as in a new, separate species derived from reptiles, even though he named it as a saur. Buckland and Smith were getting on a bit in years when a much younger Englishman called Charles Darwin embarked on a five-year voyage around the world on the HMS Beagle. Darwin was brought on the voyage as an expert on geology, and he spent three years and three months exploring the geological features on different lands. And he too was soon detailing the many varied fossilised plants and animals that he found embedded in the rocks. Perhaps the most famous part of Darwin's voyage was at the Galapagos Islands just off Ecuador, where he collected multiple new species of birds. On San Cristobal Island, he recorded a mockingbird that was similar to one he saw in Chile. He then found a different mockingbird in Floriana Island, and yet another on Isabella. He also collected multiple samples of what he thought were blackbirds, grosbeaks, and finches, some of which you can see here. When Darwin finally returned home, he presented these birds that he had collected to an English ornithologist named John Gould for identification. Gould's discovery was quite shocking. From his research, he determined that the gross beaks, blackbirds, and finches that Darwin had captured were in fact all finches. Twelve, in fact, new species of finch found nowhere else in the world. And of the 26 birds that Darwin presented to Gould, 25 of them were said to be new and distinct from anything else in the known world. From the combination of his own observations and the information that he was given by Gould, Darwin concluded that all of these bird species had adapted to better fit their environment. Charles Darwin observed that animals tend to produce more offspring than the available food supply can support. And when food is scarce, it causes a struggle for existence. The fittest of the offspring, or more accurately, the best adapted offspring survive. Basically, animals that are better at exploiting the available food sources will tend to live longer. And those that live longer have more offspring. That's just logical. But let me elaborate on that point. If you're a bird species in one of the islands where a certain type of insect is in plentiful supply, having a long pointed beak like we see in this warbler finch, the fourth one here, that would be an advantage. Birds that eat insects generally have long pointed beaks. 
because it lets them get food from more difficult places deeper in trees and further in the ground. But what if drought had to hit some of the islands and suddenly insects were far less available and the primary food source now became harder seeds and nuts? Every time these warbler finches had offspring, more of the offspring would die because there simply was not enough food for them all to survive. Within any population, there are small differences. Some people are taller and stronger than others, and some of the birds have slightly larger and stronger beaks than the rest. And when the abundant food runs out, those with the stronger beaks, they've still got access to the more difficult food supplies, like harder shelled nuts. And in fact, only one year of a particularly severe drought on the islands in 2003 brought a large change in beak size to one of the species of finch. This large ground finch that we see here had arrived on the island and they ate all the larger sized seeds. There were far more of these medium beaked finches to start with on the island, but it was the ones with the smaller beaks that actually survived better because they ate the smaller seeds that were left over. These true medium sized beaked finches perished in huge numbers and essentially nowadays this medium beaked finch has much smaller beaks than they did previous to the severe drought in 2003. Darwin had no concept of genetics or gene inheritance like we do today. We know that we get half of our genetic material, our chromosomes, from both of our parents. 23 pairs of chromosomes for 46 in total, half from our mum and half from our dad. And this is why we have traits from both of our parents. However, during reproduction, whenever DNA is replicated, there's also a chance that genetic mutations can occur. I'll talk more in depth about mutations and DNA later, but today we know through genetics that the Galapagos finches are very closely related to this little dull colored grass quit, which is found throughout South America. This one species of bird found its way to the Galapagos Islands and it evolved into all of these 13 species with differences as clear as these. Darwin had evolved his own theory too, but due to fear of ridicule, he kept it quiet for almost 20 years before another English scientist, Alfred Russell Wallace, approached Darwin with his theory of evolution through natural selection, which he had come to independently. They jointly launched a paper on the subject before Darwin finally decided it was now time to release his famous book on the origin of species. And as I said, Darwin was a geologist, and due to the fossil record in rocks, he was well aware that the species we see on Earth today are not the same species that existed in the past, although they do resemble them. Like William Smith before him, he was also well aware that the older fossils were more basic compared to the newer fossils. So in his Origin of Species, Darwin proposed the theory that all life had evolved from much simpler forms to more complex forms, and stated that, Innumerable transitional forms must have existed, but he wondered, why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the Earth? In Darwin's time, there were plenty of fossils around, but nobody had found something that looked like it was in between species. However, if evolution through natural selection was true, these transitional fossils simply had to exist. The origin of species made no claims of human evolution, and Darwin's theory soon gained near complete acceptance in the scientific community.